Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Klein, and this is Dr. Bill Peterson. Hello. Uh, we're surgeons with Ortho Virginia, and welcome to our Facebook Live focusing on outpatient total joint surgery. For those who don't know Ortho Virginia, it is the largest multi specialty group practice in Virginia. And Bill and I practice in Northern Virginia. We also have offices in Lynchburg, Richmond, and Virginia Beach. Um, we thought it'd be nice to hear directly from one of our patients. We have uh, Mr. Rich Diver here. He'll be talking to us shortly. Um, if you have questions about and information that you want to hear about Ortho Virginia, please look at our website at www.orthovirginia.com. Um, we want to talk about the outpatient total joint, specifically uh, total hips and total knees, uh, what it is, uh, how you evaluate patients who have these problems, what the process is like, how to talk to your doctor about uh, outpatient total joint surgery as an option. Um, before we get started, if you have friends that are interested, please contact them and uh, let them know that uh, they take a minute to look at this live event and just click on the share button and send it to them. Bill. All right. So I'm Dr. Peterson, Bill Peterson. Um, so before we get into our topic for tonight, which is, again is outpatient <clears throat> joint replacement, uh, let's talk briefly about what is total joint replacement and why you might need a replacement in the first place. So more than half of the uh, older adult population in the United States suffer from some sort of arthritis. They may not even know it. And I bet a lot of you are shaking your head right now saying, yes, that's me. Um, most often pain in a joint is associated with arthritis. That's where the cartilage that cushions our joints starts to wear down, causing swelling, pain, and disability for some. Since the 1960s, people with severe osteoarthritis have had the option of replacement with a prosthesis made of either metal, ceramic, plastic. The prosthetic design has been improved over the years, but it's designed to replicate the normal motion and movement of a healthy joint. According to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, there's about over 300,000 total hip replacements done in this country each year, which brings us to the topic for tonight, which is outpatient total joint replacements, which we also refer to as same day joint replacements. So research has shown us that in the past five years, uh, we were only doing about 15% of our joint replacements as a same day outpatient procedure. Um, however, that has kind of changed pretty dramatically for us over the past couple of years. And uh, we're predicting that by the year 2026, that we're going to be doing more than half, about 51% of our joint replacements as an outpatient. There's multiple different reasons for that. And Dr. Klein and I, one of our goals is to help explain that to you tonight. So now let's go to what we're all here to learn about tonight, outpatient total joints. So uh, we're going to kind of go back and forth and talk about um, what your questions might be about it, but you know we're going to go over what it is, why we're seeing the increase in outpatient total joint volume, and what are the benefits, and whether or not it's right for you. So as a reminder, please submit questions uh, on the chat so that uh, we can answer them. We have someone here who's going to help us feed a question so that we can answer them. And our goal is to get to as many as we can, and we will be following up with some blog posts to address questions that we're not able to answer tonight. Uh, despite the fact that uh, the way we do total hips has changed, we've changed uh, our process. It used to be you'd be in the hospital for when I was in practice, you'd be in for 10 days. You didn't oh, see yeah, heard So 10 weeks. days, and then basically it got down to five, then four, you know, then down to outpatient staying in the hospital, and now it's outpatient in the surgical center. So that has all changed. How that's come about has been fascinating to watch, but the causes for hip pain have pretty much stayed the same. Um, so those diagnoses and those processes um, are very similar. So for the hip, people think that the hip is where women wear their skirts, and that's not really, that's the pelvis. So it's still part of things that can be a problem, but it's not generally arthritis. So the, the hip is a joint where the ball and the socket move, and there's a lots of things that surround that, that hip. So a, a lot of common causes for hip pain. Uh, are tendonitis. People can get that from just using their, their hip too much and they pull and they get inflammation in the tendons where they attach. Uh, and that tends to be resolved fairly quickly with medication and, and stretching programs. 
Bursitis is a very common problem, and it hurts on the side of the hip when people lie on the side and they have significant pain. And sometimes it can be excruciating. It sends people to the, op, to, to the emergency room. Um, oftentimes it's just nagging, nagging pain, and that can be diagnosed by touching the side of the hip. Very simple to diagnose. And oftentimes a simple cortisone shot, but that can make a difference. Commonly, people have back pain and have crossed over between what's called sciatica, where the nerve gets irritated, and hip pain. And sometimes it's hard to tease out what is what. Uh, but oftentimes it takes a surgeon and a good examination, a good story to see whether that, you know, how, which is which. Uh, but oftentimes that's in the back of the, uh, the hip, in the buttock area, and extends down the leg past the knee. Uh, when it comes to arthritis, most commonly, but not always, it's groin pain in the, in the groin. So uh, where, where your seam would be. So that's where people have pain when they rotate their hip. They'll have discomfort when they, when they lift the leg, have a hard time putting their shoes on. And very commonly, that's a sign. Not always, but very commonly. Some people will come in with knee pain. They'll actually say, my knee is killing me. And you have to take a good exam to tease out the fact that it's truly coming from the hip. So there are variations and there are exceptions. Uh, one of our patients today did not have classic hip presentation, but still had severe arthritis. So these are some common causes. There's multiple you know, causes for, for hip pain in younger people. We won't belabor that too much. But there could be something like stress fractures and people who get older can actually get fractures in their hip that present as hip pain as well. So those are the things that you think about when we look at, look at our patients. Um, can I just ask real quick, please, like, just sure. in general, um, especially if you speak up a little bit louder, please. Sure. Thank you. The, um, with regard to the knee, uh, the, a knee arthritis will, will oftentimes present with swelling in the knee, aching with walking, mainly pain with activity. Um, not as much rest pain, but more pain with activity. Uh, very commonly, it can be tendonitis with activity, uh, with uh, jumping and with, with moving in different directions or over, overuse tendonitis. But uh, and various forms of inflammation can occur in and around the knee with tendonitis as well. But joint arthritis, recurring pain, recurring swelling, aching, limited range of motion are often the most common signs of uh, knee osteoarthritis. So, um, so a good question would be next to go over would be when is it time to come to see you know Dr. Klein or myself? Now, um, a lot of joint problems can be kind of initially managed by your primary care physician. We use exercises, heat, ice, anti-inflammatories, over-the-counter anti-inflammatories to kind of manage that pain. Um, but when it comes to the point where those are not necessarily getting you over the hump it's a good idea to talk to your primary care and see if you can get a referral. Now, Dr. Klein and I have patients that we see primarily and manage their pain chronically and do uh, things to manage them and uh, take care of them until their ultimate, usually end game, which is some sort of replacement. So uh, if you're curious about why you're having some pain in your knee and it's not going away, we're more than happy to see you or go through your primary care. Um, but the, the, you know, the idea is that this is a, it can be chronic, it can be acute, it can be from overuse, it can be from old injuries, there's a whole sorts of different things. And if you're curious, come make an appointment with us, we're available, we're uh, all across the state and in Northern Virginia, we're more than happy to see you or ask your primary care physician, and they can help you initially and then get you on to us. As Dr. Peterson was talking about, there are treatment options that that the people that the docs other than orthopedic specialists can manage, but there are treatment options that we would go through. And, and in general, we start slowly. For most patients, we start off with the most conservative alternatives. We don't jump right into surgery. Now, occasionally you have somebody who comes in and they've just waited a long, long time. I call them hello hips or hello knees. Hello, I want my hip replaced. Hello, I want my knee replaced. They are already done without doing many of those other alternatives, but most are not that way. Most you can actually work through many, many years. You don't want to jump into a joint replacement too soon. They have a finite life expectancy as far as how long they'll last. And so it's important that you try to do this if you have to do it once in your life. So if you can manage those um, conservative me measures to be able to get through that process and, and get long enough into your age or your career or whatever so that you can do this only once. And some of those things we'll do are activity modifications. So somebody like our patient that's visiting today was running and running and running and realized you have to stop running and maybe you'll last a little bit longer. Uh, some people decide basketball is off and they can last another five or six years. So activity modification 
for many can really make a big difference. There's a certain point where that modifying activity where you say you can't take a trip to, to Europe because you can't walk the cobblestones, well then that's probably giving up too much for most people. After that, you can look at physical therapy. There's physical therapy that you can do that can strengthen the muscles around your joints, that can help get you a little bit of longevity, it can certainly make you more comfortable, make it safer for you, and make your surgery more successful as well. Then there's anti-inflammatory medications. Some people are willing to take medications. Some people say, I'm not putting medicines in my body, and that's up to the, each individual person. But oftentimes, that can help get through a couple of phases to sort of buy a little bit more time. Injections can be very, very helpful. Cortisone injections are, can be helpful to buy a lot of time. They're very effective uh, for most patients, but not everybody. And you have to be careful with other medical conditions, whether cortisone is the right thing for you. Um, but that can help, especially in the total knee population. The total hip population, I find that it only helps for three to six months, maybe. But some people have gotten more benefit than that. And ultimately, the surgery. Surgery is the, the type of thing you want to put off as long as you can. I had a patient come in today. She said she'd be watching, so I'll call out. And she wanted her knee replaced. Says my brother had his knee replaced, my mom had their knee replaced, and they're doing great. And I know I need to have it done, but I'm not hurting that much. But I just want to get it done while I'm young. And that's a little aggressive because this is not risk-free. This is something you have to think about. You want to try to maximize all the conservative measures, especially if you're in your 50s or your 40s, where that time really makes a big difference. So for those who end up failing conservative management, um, you may be indicated for a, a total joint replacement. And uh, so the topic we're here to talk about is outpatient joint replacements. Now, outpatient joint replacements aren't new. Um, this has been, patients have been going home the same day for years, but it's become more popular uh, for over the past couple of years. Now, there's a couple of reasons that have been big, big drivers of that. One of the One of them is, their uh, Medicare or the Central for Medicare to Medicaid Services have rules about what certain procedures can be done only in a hospital and what procedures are safe to do as an outpatient. And over the past few years, total joints, total hips and total knees are starting to come off that inpatient only list, which has made orthopedic surgeons and uh, our colleagues who we work with, our anesthesiologists and the hospitals more keen to try to prepare patients for the future of doing the surgery more and more as an outpatient. And believe it or not, the pandemic probably played another big driver and accelerator for us in doing these more and more as an outpatient. You know, we had to shut down a lot of these elective cases during the pandemic, but for patients that couldn't hold off and were really struggling, we started to turn to outpatient joint replacements. And there's a couple reasons why we're more and more successful with it these days. And some of the big drivers is how we're approaching how to recover. As Dr. Klein alluded to, you know, the days of long inpatient admissions, we realize aren't necessary. We, we look for rapid recovery. We look for better pain control during surgery and after surgery with our anesthesia colleagues who have made big strides. We look at um, getting patients, we use new techniques and closure of the wounds. There are a lot of things that have been driving us. And what we're starting to realize is that we can do that incredibly safe if we have the right patient and uh, indicate the right person. And there's a lot of good factors that we'll go over. Um, but there still are some patients that are not candidates for outpatient surgery, um, you know, that are still going to be done in the hospital. So those are good discussions to have with us. Um, so when you come to that place where you're ready to be have failed conservative management because of hip or chronic knee pain, and you're ready to talk about the surgical options, um, you come to see us and we can go over whether or not you're the right patient, whether or not which setting is more appropriate for you to do it, whether in the hospital as an outpatient or whether in an outpatient surgery center. There's multiple different uh, ways to go about discussing the surgical options when it comes to joint replacements for knees and hips. In light of that, you say, you know, Dr. Person outlined, th this is how do you pick that patient? That is, there's an art to picking the right person and the right patient for an outpatient procedure. And you say, well, who is that patient? Yeah. Um, one, you have to be medically safe. So you can't have multiple morbidities, significant medical problems, significant concerns with regard to your health with uncontrolled diabetes, significant breathing issues. Those issues are, are certainly important that people need 
patients need to be done in the hospital. But on the flip side, there's many healthy patients that have minor problems that can be easily managed and very, very safely in an outpatient center. So that's important to, 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 to decide who is safe. Secondly, I call it the X factor. You need a patient who says, I got this. I'm ready. I trust you. They need to believe in the system and have confidence that it can work. And I think most of our rapid recovery and most of our, our progression in, in, our, in our techniques and why people do so well is that we tell them you're going to do well. Yeah. Our techniques in surgery have changed a little. Our anesthesia has changed a fair amount, but our expectations have been the main thing. We tell people you will be fine, and they fact will go ahead and walk and move and be faster in recovery. So that those are the, those are the things, some of the things we look at. But also, you need family support. Correct. You need to have somebody who can be go home with you, and and, and the the patients you whoever has this done will feel comfortable going home in that setting. Staying in the hospital is for people who don't have support network at home and would know that they're safe and they have a safety net. Um, so that's what I look at when I evaluate who's a good candidate. As far as the preparation goes, I got off off beat a little bit. That's all right. But as far as the preparation goes. This dovetails into that evaluation. You have to get evaluated by a primary care doctor or your medical doctor and make sure that we're safe. Make sure your heart's working. Make sure the lungs are working. And there's no factors that are cons of concern as well as blood tests and things that will weed out patients that, that don't uh, aren't, aren't the best candidates for outpatient surgery. Um, so the medical evaluation, occasionally we'll start prehab as well. We'll have a physical th therapist to see you beforehand. And that's important oftentimes just to connect, know where you're going. So when the procedure is done, you, got, you know that the team is going to be working with you. Uh, and they can also help with strengthening and range of motion. So those are things we do to get ready. There's some obviously a lot of technical things we do to get ready, conversations. There's a lot of meeting with, um, with our orthopedic joint team, which we have specifically designed to help out with that. And those are, they'll go through the, the, the fine details. I think that's really a, a good point is that, you know, often when we're counseling patients on indicating from surgery, we often talk about what the hip replacement is and, you know, what the, you know, risks for surgery, what the complications, what, you know, the benefits are. But, you know, make sure you're asking us about if you're a candidate for outpatient, if you're curious about it, because I think uh, having a very uh, honest, uh, frank conversation about expectations uh, we're doing more and more of this. There are studies that are coming out all the time about the patients who do well, the patients who don't do well. And we, we understand that literature and we can have that discussion with you about, um, you know, looking at your chart, getting to know you over the years, whether or not you're a good candidate. for. It. Um, all right. So you're ready for surgery. Um, so what do, what can you expect during surgery, especially let's talk about the outpatient setting. So as Dr. Clyde alluded to, this is a big team effort. Um, you know, leading up to surgery, during surgery, you're going to see that there. This is a very coordinated uh, effort amongst multiple different people involved in the care for you during surgery, before, during, and after surgery. Um, we have nurses that reach out to our patients prior to surgery, talking about what to expect on the day of surgery, what to expect after. We have online content. We used to do in-person joint classes where we educate patients. Um, but those are good pieces of uh, data points to kind of get before you're going into that outpatient setting to understand what to expect, what, what's going to happen on the day of surgery, what the anesthesiologists are going to be doing, what's going to feel like after surgery. Anesthesia, the team has probably, uh, what I tell my patients, if there's something that's changed dramatically over the past couple of years and replacements that's led us to this point, I think is what our anesthesiologists are doing for us in terms of pain control and uh, efforts to kind of keep pain at bay for the first 24 to 48 hours and how we manage pain after surgery. We kind of approach pain a lot differently these days. And I say even three to five years ago, we kind of, a, rather than throwing narcotics on our patients, which was kind of the old norm, we kind of approach it with a, what we call a multimodal approach to managing pain. So our anesthesiologists do a fantastic job. We try to, as best as we can, do it under regional anesthesia using a spinal to numb you from the waist down. Often it, it depends on surgeon's preferences, but they'll also do some guided blocks for cer certain nerves around whatever joint we're working on to help keep the pain fibers at bay so that you can have good control for the first 24 to 48 hours after surgery, they're fantastic. And a lot of those questions about anesthesia, 
we can address, but you'll really kind of go over with the anesthesiologist on the day of the surgery. Um, and uh, you'll notice after surgery, it's a big coordinated effort. Um, we often uh, have physical therapists come see you. We, we depending on what type of surgery, if you're gonna get uh, home physical therapy or outpatient physical therapy, there's a lot of different facets that go into it. And uh, we're more than happy to talk about it with you. As Dr. Peterson outlined, the, you know, the multimodal pain management is, the way it works is there's, a, there's about six or seven pills that you'll take. It sounds like it's almost like eating breakfast uh, with the pills in the morning for most of our patients. Yeah. And what it does, it hits multiple different pathways in the pain management, and they release at different times. So some last four to six hours, some last eight to 12 hours, some last even longer than the blocks. And the numbing medicine helps this all work it's almost seamlessly as far as the pain goes. And we found over the years, the narcotics for pain management are the worst thing. The more you give people pain management, pain pills, I should say narcotic pain pills, the, the worse they do. So we have patients that t take almost none. Yes. They take a single, single low-level tramadol medication, and they take none. And years back, that's almost unheard of. Yeah, there, there's been a huge shift across the country to get patients away from narcotics. And, and, and that dovetails into the complications. Like, yeah. why, why can we do it here? Why is it better to do it here? What is it that makes the, the you know, Herndon Operatory here with Ortho Virginia work better? Um, it's this team approach. It's it's the, the the physical therapist working with us in, a, in in an area where we repeat and repeat and repeat. So we do with the same team over and over again. Um, it it's it is in, very interesting to see how well these patients can do. Yeah, and and I think uh, it's important to realize is that we've we've learned from our you know we we learn from the literature. We learn from our experiences, and you know the days of x-rays in the hospital, checking your blood work, what we've realized, and we go back and look at it, that that's not necessary. And we can safely send patients home. And uh, we've learned from that. And uh, the coordinated team effort, you're gonna have multiple touch points before surgery, the day after, calls when you go home that afternoon. Um, Dr. Klein and I both call our patients that next morning to make sure they're doing okay. So we don't, you're not off on an island and we give you all the tools to manage whatever you're going to need to expect. And what we've demonstrated is that we don't have patients coming back to the emergency room for, you know, an excruciating pain or we're available. We have nurses calling you after and, and has made this an ex extremely successful endeavor for us. And the data shows that the infection rate is lower. So Absolutely. the infection rate is lower because we're not in a hospital where infections live. Yep. Two, the blood clot rate is lower because you have to, to get, get up, up and you move. So these things, which are very simple factors, make the success rate of a patient who does outpatient Absolutely. even higher. So it is sort of counterintuitive sometimes. And I think, you know, as I said, the, the pandemic has certainly accelerated this. Absolutely. And I think even now uh, it makes even more sense to, to do this safely, to do it in, as an outpatient, whether it's in the hospital or with our excellent team here at our outpatient Herndon Operatory Center, uh, even even more a great option and, and something to ask us about when you come see us. We pretty much already talked about the rehab. Yeah. We, we, the rapid recovery, we get people up and moving quickly for our total hips, uh, for the outpatient total hips, they will get a visit at home for safety checks and they'll, they'll have a, a visit for uh, maybe one, up to one or two weeks. Correct. And then after that, for most of our patients, we just tell them to walk for our total joint, for total hips. Total knees are a different story. Correct. Uh, they need to be pushed, and therapy is critical. Uh, you can get limited range of motion. You can, patients can get scar tissue and, and get stiff. And so therapy on a regular basis is a really critical part of all total needs. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, you need a good relationship uh, with the physical therapist and the doctor both. We have a large nine practices or nine physical therapy centers in the area that we work with as well. Obviously, you can work with other physical therapists that you're uh, that you're um, uh, that, that you, you've used in the past as well. So it's not like you have to use orthopedic therapy, but it's critical to have that communication. Correct. Um, and I think patients are still. It's um, it, it amazes me that they're still uh, surprised to hear that we get up, we get them walking immediately after surgery. We have a patient here today. They'll talk about his experience as an outpatient, and it's it's always amazing. We use the anesthesiologist can get the anesthesia out of your system within hours or not even an hour after yeah. surgery. And we have patients up walking 
in our recovery room, you know, 30 to 45 minutes up to an hour after surgery. And, and, cool. and that rapid recovery makes all the difference. Well, why don't we bring Rich Divert up and uh, he's willing, uh, Rich is uh, a patient of, of mine who, uh, we'll, hold, we'll hold it for both of us, I guess, if this one's too much taller than no. me, at least now. Um, Thanks for having me. He, who, uh, three months ago underwent a, a total hip replacement uh, in the Herman Surgical Center here. Um, and he's going to sort of tell us about what brought him to, to get the hip replacement in the first in the first place, and then go on. We'll, we'll discuss a couple of things. What what? Uh, how did you present? Well, I had uh, some pain on the outside of my hip. I didn't have a lot of the other major symptoms, but I was a runner, and I couldn't solve it. I thought maybe it was something minor. And after uh, exploring or cutting back on my running, I figured I better get this looked at. And so I also work in my workshop, and I couldn't do my daily activity in there of building things out of wood, lifting wood, carrying wood. So I, I knew something was going on. So I, I needed to get that checked out because I'd like to be active. I'd like to get on those cobblestones in uh, Europe sometimes. So uh, sitting around was not for me. I needed to be active. Uh, give us a little idea what your experience was when you arrived here, how it made you feel, what the, the group was like and sort of how, how your experience was. Yeah, it's uh, it, it was fantastic. I mean, it really felt like uh, almost like family. I mean, I came in and uh, everyone's very calm and reassuring, very professional. I was very impressed with all the pre-op uh, going in, and I felt comfortable with the anesthesiologist and the physician's assistants, all the nurses, and everybody getting me ready, including the calls ahead of time saying, this is what you'll expect. That was very helpful. And then coming out of the surgery, minimum pain. Again, the recovery crew was great, uh, teaching me how to use the walker, which I didn't use very long. And a few other things, here's what to expect. So uh, it was actually, and I've said this before, it was easier than going to the dentist to get a filling. I, I just thought it was, uh, it was great. So Richard, do you think that the, were you properly educated about what to expect the day of surgery, what to expect with the pain levels and the recovery? Right. I was pleasantly surprised that I didn't have a lot of pain. Uh, I did feel well prepared with what was going to happen to me and what the procedures were going to be and what to expect. I didn't take a lot of the, I took some of the mild pain medication at the second or third day. I just went to Tylenol because I don't like taking pain medication. And sometimes it makes me a little fuzzy, so I didn't want to take it. And I just went to Tylenol and some ice packs and that seemed to work well for me. I was able to sleep from the get go. And uh, other than lying on that side, I couldn't sleep on my lucky side. Mm. I had to sleep uh, comfortably on my back or uh, on my other side, but uh, no, I felt well prepared, and uh, yeah, it just went really well for me. I, I couldn't be happier. Can you give everyone an idea? I, I know we talked about when you arrived and what time you left, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we say same day surgery, right? Which, what does that mean? You know, well, uh, arrived at 5 30, I think surgery was scheduled for 7 30, and I remember being up and about probably 10 30. I was home for lunch. So I was in my chair in my house next to my bathroom, able to sleep in my bed, um, went up my stairs. My children helped me. My wife helped me. So I had the support that you talked about, which is very important. But just to be back in your house is just, I, you can't say enough about that. That, that was uh, great to not have to stay in the hospital. Yeah, not having nurses waking you up in the middle of the night to check your blood pressure right. and multiple hours. So could you just tell the, the, the people who are watching like where you are now in your recovery and you know how you're doing? Sure. It's been a little over three months. Uh, it's I've been doing, I'm very strong. I've been doing a lot of the exercises. I have no pain. I sleep through the night. Uh, if I overdo it in my workshop, I might take some Tylenol for the next day, but I really haven't done that in a couple of weeks. Uh, I've got uh, good endurance. I, I feel most comfortable wearing my running shoes because they absorb some of the impact. My dress shoes, I get a little tired in my dress shoes, so I don't wear those so often. So I think footwear is very important. Uh, I did notice also, because I captured a little bit more length in my leg that my back pain went away because I had been limping a little bit. And it was interesting when I first stood up with the walker, I'm like, wow, I'm a little bit taller. At least I felt that way because I got that half inch or so back and my back pain has been eliminated so. and, and this is a very common scenario and again it, we're at three months and by six months most people have sort of forgotten that they've had surgery done 
Uh, so it's still very early on and you're still feeling great, but it gets even better and better to the point where one is not even aware of an artificial joint. But I'm so glad you had a great experience here. Um, it's been do you have four questions? No, I think it's that's been great. wonderful. Yeah, and we you appreciate took it. up your time to come and chat with everybody about it. And it's been very, very useful. Anytime. Yeah. Anything I can do to help somebody process this yeah. and uh, yeah. do what's best for them. All right. Thank well, you, thanks, sir. Man. Thank you. All right. Well, um, we've talked a lot and we've kind of heard from our guests tonight. Uh, we hope you find these tips helpful. Um, we can't emphasize enough, you know, please stay in contact with your orthopedic care team during this time. If you're an ortho Virginia patient, we've got uh, a great tool with our online electronic medical record with my chart, which makes it easy for patients or to send us questions um and uh to reach out to us we have people checking those daily um uh, but uh hopefully uh, i think we're going to open it up to questions from the audience um dr kleiner are happy to get through as many as we can tonight perfect thank you both so much and thank you for coming in we appreciate it some of these you may have answered so i apologize if i ask you something you have answered first question how many years have you been doing outpatient total joint replacement I'm forgetful. I think it's been about six years, uh, if I had to go back. Uh, so, and the volume has definitely increased. Uh, um, you you want to make sure you've got the system down. So as the system grew, as the system got safer and safer, we did more and more. It's been about six years. So I've been in practice with Ortho Virginia for about two years now. And I'd say over the past year, uh, my volume's increased. And, and uh, you know, a lot comes from surgeon comfort and uh, having the right team around you to be able to be successful at it. And uh, Ortho Virginia, I think, does a fantastic job to allow us to offer that to our patients. Okay, I'm being asked if you all can repeat the question that I asked you. Please. So if you don't mind that being okay. okay. What will be missed by not being in the hospital for an overnight stay? What will be missed by not being in the hospital for an overnight stay? Um, Again, the safety part, if in fact you have cardiac issues, monitoring is necessary, overnight monitoring is necessary. Um, if you have sleep apnea that is severe, uh, we worry about people not breathing as well with some of the pain medications that can be used. So some of that monitoring will be missed. Um, otherwise, there is not much that is missed. Yeah. I don't know if you've... I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, that's a part of our job in choosing the right patients mm -hmm. uh, who need to be uh, an inpatient setting for this and who can uh, successfully do it as an outpatient. Um, you know, when we have patients with multiple comorbidities who need to be monitored by nurses for their vital signs, um, you know, people who come in with, um, you know, multiple comorbidities like diabetes or a cardiac condition where maybe they have an arrhythmia or something like that, where we need to be watching them closely. Um, but uh, for those that are healthy enough, um, you know, you're not missing much. You're, you're not getting those wake up calls in the middle of the night for the check your blood pressure. You know, as I alluded to earlier, we know, you know, in a healthy individual, we don't need to check their, you know, their blood work in the morning. So, you know, missing those needle sticks uh, are helpful. And, 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 you know, and what, what a lot of this is, it's wasteful. We realize that it's not necessary. It's extra cost to the system that um, don't really yield any results. And the only other issue I see is people, there's patients who have poor pain tolerance. Correct. And that patient is not necessarily the best person for uh, patient surgery. And that's us to, te the docs should tease that out. And generally we can, we can find that out by examining patients that we can tell who is sensitive to pain. And those things are sometimes hard. So people say, well, why can't I go? Yeah. And we just say, well, we don't think you're necessarily a good candidate for that. Uh, but those are some factors that I see. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, 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 you know, I think if you're thinking about it, if you have a joint coming up or you're thinking about it, uh, you know, ask the question. And I, I'm more than happy. I call my patients the day before surgery. Uh, you know, you can let, you know, their surgical schedule you're dealing with, you know, reach out to Dr. Clyde or myself to answer that question for you. Because um, this is the wave of the future for us in how we do uh, these procedures. And it's going to become more and more common. Um, and uh, you're not going to know if you're a good candidate unless you ask. Thank you. This one is somewhat of a two-part question because several people have been asking about the difference between anterior hip, lateral hip, 
the main question is, does the approach of the HIP in any way dictate whether someone would stay overnight or go home? So I'll answer that question. So the question was uh, for us to kind of discuss the different approach, surgical approaches to a hip replacement, whether it's through the front, the anterior, lateral, or posterior approach, and whether or not the approach dictates if you can be a candidate for an outpatient or make you more likely. So, um, so I, 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 I mean, Dr. Klana will kind of we're we're, we're both uh, joint replacement special specialists. But when it comes to a hip replacement, we're we kind of come from two different camps. So I do what we call an anterior total hip or direct anterior total hip replacement. Um, what we know from the literature is that at the end of the day, no matter if you have an anterior approach done with me or a, a, a lateral, or we both do posterior approach as well, one year, 10 years, five years, 10 years from now, it's the same joint and patients do the exact same way. Now, Dr. Klein and I could probably be here for all night discussing the the risks, the benefits, uh, the the pros, the cons, um, and you know those are good discussions to come and to see us to go over. Um, but really, uh, it has not changed. the The approach does not influence whether or not you can go home the same day. Correct. Um, and, and I think that's because of our anesthesia is getting better, our expectations, our educating the patients are getting better, and how we manage pain is is better. Um, so it, it really does not uh, change whether or not you're going to be a candidate by what the surgeon, uh, uh, how the how the replacement is done. Now, and Dr. Klein and I were talking about this before we came on live. Uh, what you really need to find is a surgeon that feels comfortable and knows what they're doing and um, is comfortable in that approach and is and can and says that it's the right approach for you. I mean, there's nuances to each approach. There's risks to each approach. And there's complications with each, and it's a balancing act. And each surgeon finds that comfort zone, uh, and there's advantages to each one of them, and disadvantages to each one of them. Correct. So the main thing is to understand for your question is that no, it does not affect the outpatient, uh, whether it's outpatient or not. Correct. I think we both 100% agreement with that. I, I completely agree. And we do. We have surgeons uh, do all three approaches um, here at our outpatient Correct. surgery center and do it extremely successfully. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, and a few people have asked this, is there a way of knowing how many things you try before you end up with a total knee replacement? Is there a way to know how many different types of treatment you try before a total knee replacement? And the answer is no, there's not a right answer. Each patient is individualized. As I said, there are patients that I will manage and have managed for 10, 15 years with severe arthritis, with various methods of treatment who still aren't ready and shouldn't necessarily move forward with a total joint replacement. And there's others, as I, as I said earlier, who come in and I know from the minute I see them, their eyes, they're finished. They've, they've waited as long as they can. And at, at hello, I will suggest that the total joint replacement is the best option. So it, there isn't a right answer for everyone. It, um, it's definitely patient specific. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's contextualized to each individual case. Um, you know, I, I stress to my patients is when you, you, everything that we have to throw at you, the medicines, the therapy, the weight loss, the activity modification, they're not doing it. And you can't do what you want to do. And, and we've talked about what you want to do can be very um, individualized in terms of what that means. So, um, no, it, it's uh, it, 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 the truth of the matter is you got to try some sort of conservative measure. You got to try something. Um, but uh, when you say no more and it's and the the tools that we have to try to make help you live with their band-aids right we're just managing symptoms we can't correct the loss of your shock absorbers in your joint we can't correct the loss of the cartilage you know we talk about all these injections that are out there that say they regenerate cartilage they don't we don't we can't do that right now so uh it's it's individualized to each individual when they're ready for a joint the next question is, is outpatient surgery okay for people with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? So the question is, uh, is outpatient surgery um, okay for uh, the condition that they were referring to as Ehlers-Danlos, which is a connective tissue disorder, um, a genetic disorder that patients are born with and they have um, and they deal with on, as a chronic basis. Now, you know, these are discussions that you need to have with us as a surgeon. Um, there are conditions that uh, place certain individuals at higher anesthe anesthetic risks um, and have different uh, 
characteristics in terms of what they have of your overall health. Ehlers Danlos has specific cardiac um, abnormalities that can potentially make you not a candidate for outpatient surgery um, and or maybe needs to be done in a hospital setting where we can quickly turn you over to an inpatient. But you know the the, the there are specific conditions that um, even Dr. Klein and I can't necessarily answer that question. And we that's where we rely on a team effort from your primary care, your cardiac surgeon, your hematologist, your you know your uh, the whole the whole team effort. This is a specific very specific question. Uh, but there's nine different variations of ehlers So There's people with very mild forms that probably would Correct. be candidates. People have very serious forms that are clearly not candidates. So it's a very complex question. And again, that's a dis discussion we would have with the entire healthcare team. I agree with that. Thank you. A couple of people have asked about returning to activity. And one was specific about, I'm a hiker. How long post hip replacement could I begin hiking again? So the question was, um, after joint replacement, uh, how quickly can you return to uh, certain activities or your normal activities? And the question was uh, in uh, specifically asking for hip replacement and returning to hiking. Um, so I, I think we should be clear, there's, there's different recoveries between a hip replacement surgery and a knee replacement. They're two very different recoveries. Um, most of our patients, I'd say three months is a pretty good mark where they're starting to kind of really accelerate in terms of the recovery. I tell my patients it's around six weeks where they get over that initial trauma from the surgery, the inflammation from Dr. Klein and I making the incision, retracting muscles, and the pain associated with just with the surgery starts to calm down. And six weeks tends to be for me uh, that kind of magic time where you start to get over that. And then between six weeks and three months, there's a big takeoff in terms of symptoms starting to wind down, strength, mobility, uh, inflammation getting better. Now, three months is uh, where I think people are feeling pretty darn good where they can get back to the normal activity. Now, for a hip replacement patient, I think hiking is reasonable to start doing around three months. Um, every activity is, uh, is contextualized to the individual, but um, you know, look, at the end of the day, this is a full year recovery. That's what I tell my patients. You're gonna continue and improve for up to a year after surgery. So, um, you know, it, it's not three months, it may be six months, everyone's a little bit different. And, and Dr. Klein alluded to, you know, the people that come into surgery and go through are fit and do their best to kind of get themselves ready. Those are the ones that are able to kind of return to those activities sooner. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Peterson. I think, you know, the hiking one is an easy, easier question. The, the harder question is, can they do impact exercises, yeah. impact loading? Can I run again? Can I play basketball again? And uh, each, some surgeons basically say, you can do what you want. Um, I'm a little bit different. I think that I try to get longevity out of the joint. If they're 80 years old, they can do what they want. But if you're 60 years old or 50 years old and you want it to last a certain finite timeline, then it, I liken it to a car or a vehicle. Yeah. There's a certain number of, of, of miles and impact on it. This is not, it's not time dependent. It's how you beat up your car, whether you drive the rough road, whether you put on 30,000 miles a, a year or, or 15 miles, the car will fail. It's a mechanical device. Yeah. And so pounding on that with impact, playing soccer, or playing you know, uh, uh, crashing mountain bike riding. As long as you don't crash, you're fine. So minimize the crashing, minimize the pounding. Yeah. And then from that point forward, you can do what you want I, and it should last. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and I think the real, the realistic nature of this is that we are starting to do these joint replacements, especially now that we're doing more outpatients on younger and younger populations. And we don't quite know what these cohorts look like in the future, how much they can get back. There's some early studies that are coming out. Uh, there's one that was recently published that talked about running only about 20% of people get back to the level of running that they really want to. Um, and, and we'll know more as we get to the future, but I think Dr. Klein's absolutely right. We, you know, from a surgeon's perspective, we're thinking about the longevity of the joint. Patients want to get back to their life. They want to get back to their activities and you can, but there's trade-offs when it comes to that. Okay. Thank you. I believe you both just answered this one, but I'll just make sure a couple of people have asked about the lifespan, excuse me, the lifespan of the joint that you replaced, but it seems like it's just dependent on each person. Well, so the question was, what is the average lifespan of a total hip or total knee? And it's changing. It's morphed. It used to be 10 to 15 years, um, probably 20 or 30 years ago, uh, maybe 30 years ago. 
Um, but now it's changed. The materials have changed. The, the cementing techniques and knees have changed. The porous ingrowth and the way the bone grows into a, a, a press fit stem that does not cement it in a, in, a, in a hip has changed. And the bearing surfaces have changed. And with that in mind, they've lasted longer and longer and longer. And I tell my patients now that I think the, these are lasting 25 years. I think, and we don't know. We don't, as Dr. Peterson said, we don't know what the future holds. But we're seeing patients that just are coming in 20 years later. They're still doing fine. It hasn't worn out. And so I think that 25 years is a reasonable time frame to say as long as you're, quote, good to it. Correct. The, the less that you impact or the more that you impact and the more that you pound, the more you crash, that longevity is going to start to come off of that 25 years. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and look, I mean, this is still major surgery. There are things that can happen when we do these procedures, but in, in the best case scenario, uh, I, I think you're looking at about 20, 25 plus yeah. years yeah. potentially. And, and, you know, like I said, we're following patients now that are getting these new materials that these companies are always trying to make more durable and more wear resistant. And we won't know until we kind of get these patients out. One of the questions that always asks, why can't I just do it again? And so that's, that's why just not do it again and it'll be fine. Well, the recovery of the second one is different. The, the success, the complication rate goes up, the, the bone stock that's available changes and the risks go up and the success rate drops. So we don't want to, to necessarily plan on doing a second procedure because the success rate is not quite as good. Correct. So just people say, well, just do it again. And I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. In general. yeah. And so I think the younger that you are and you're considering it, make sure you have that discussion with your surgeon about what to expect in the future and you know the risks and benefits of doing it at a younger age and what that second procedure will look like. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, are you requiring patients to put on the long compression stop? Um, so the question was, do you do we require patients to wear the long compressive stockings uh, after surgery? Now, um, this is when you know we get into that practicing medicine. Everyone, every surgeon has a little bit different um, post-operative protocol. Um, now, uh, I ask my patients to wear it for two weeks. Um, they're a nuisance. Uh, they they can help. Um, some, some surgeons don't necessarily require them. Some patients, some surgeons use, uh, those like sleeves that compress your legs for a couple weeks after surgery. Um, it's, it's, I think it comes down to surgeon preference for my patients. I ask them to wear it for two weeks after. And when I see them at that two week mark, once they're swelling, that can kind of track down with gravity down to their ankles, start to get better. And they're mobilizing better. It's usually around two weeks that we can get out. And so as Dr. Peterson, this is surgeon preference. Uh, we've uh, we've all evolved and changed and morphed and tried different things. I personally, we've we've gotten rid of the stockings uh, maybe ten, seven to ten years ago, and haven't felt that that adversely affected the patients. They, I mean, after hearing how people don't like them yeah. for so long, it was easy. You know, they're just so hard yeah. now, but, but they can, if they help and they keep the swelling down, they improve your progress, then it's the right thing to do. So it's all personal preference. Yeah. Uh, and there's not definitely not a right answer. Yeah. And we, we try to be data driven in right. terms of what we're doing, but there are a lot of things that are training driven where you kind of wear your trainer, yeah. you know, or through your career, what you realize is necessary. And there are different, different ways to minimize that risk of blood clot and swelling. So, right. so some form of, of compression is very, very common whether the long stockings or some other form of compression e equally as uncomfortable or annoying. Yeah. And more so for, I think, for the, the significant others, the spouses, yes. the family members <laughs> of putting them on. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. The next question is, when would you use synthetic synovial fluid injections in lieu of a knee replacement surgery? So, God, yeah. so when would you use a, a synthetic synovial uh, knee fluid instead of a knee replacement? So I suspect that they're referring to a, a product called hyaluronic acid. It sounds like it would really hurt your knee putting acid into your knee, but it's actually a very natural element that is being used. Um, there's many, many different uh, uh, products that are made to sort of help out as a lubricant in a joint. And for some people it's effective and other it is not. It's one of those things that we will try in some patients to see if we can buy more time. And I, I would say the literature suggests about 60% of those patients find it effective. But in my practice, I find 60% may say it was okay, it was worth it, but only about 30% want to do it again. And that tells me a little bit more. It's definitely worth trying, yeah. but I don't know that it's as 
it's going to regrow cartilage. It'll help with symptoms, add a little lubrication. And in some people, I bought five, six, seven years using it. Others said it didn't do anything. So it's very, very patient specific. Yeah. So uh, the way I, I educate my patients when it comes to, you know, they're, they're referred to as gel shots or visco supplementation or um, synthetic synovial fluid injections. Um, you know, the companies market them as this lubricant for the joint. Really, at the end of the day, I think the data is showing that it's another type of anti-inflammatory, kind of just the way that our steroid injections work, uh, and also just the way our PRP or plasma-rich protein or the stem cells, they're not regenerating anything. They're not really lubricating. They're more of an anti-inflammatory. And, you know, we use the term gold standard. That means that the, the best tool we really have when it comes to injections is still the steroid. Absolutely. I don't think anything is going to substitute that in terms of an option. But I absolutely agree. If we're trying to buy time for our patients who are not quite ready, either physically, mentally for a joint replacement, by all means, they play a role, I think, uh, in buying that time. Okay, thank you. The next question is, how do you determine which artificial knee is the right one for a patient? Um, so the question is, uh, how do you determine which uh, knee, artificial knee, is the right for the patient? Now, this, this is another one that kind of comes down to uh, surgeon preference. Um, there are, if, you, if this question was posed to us in the 1980s, that might be a very significant issue because there's been a lot of advancements over the past couple of decades in design, um, how these are uh, secured to the bone, how the plastics are made. Over the past five to 10 years, uh, the large companies that are making these, there are marginal differences and nuances in terms of the design and uh, the features of them. Um, but really, at the end of the day, we have big, big, what we call registry data from countries all across the world and even our country that really they're, they all perform about the same. And it comes down to what your surgeon is comfortable with, um, what your surgeon uh, uses on a routine basis uh, that leads to good success. So you want a surgeon that does high volumes of a knee replacement um, that knows what they're doing and is comfortable. And I think that's what ultimately needs. I don't know if you agree with that. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, that's what I tell people is that the data says they, it, in a surgeon who uses a particular device over and over again, the outcomes are exactly the same. That's what the data shows. And that's what we have to do. It's data driven. Um, so, so that there are nuances to each of these implants and how you put them in, how they fit, how they feel, how they sound. All these little nuances play a role in what works best. In hips in particular, sound, sound, feeling, they all have different before we have risk for complications. Two, you want something that's been around at least a little bit of time. Yeah. It's like a brand new computer that's never been out on the market. You don't want that first one off the lot because there's bugs with it. So I, I, I'd say just look at a, a, a surgeon that uses a model that's at least been around for you know, five, five, seven, ten years, something in that ballpark that has a little bit of data to be tracking. But other than that, I don't think the implant drives any any outcome. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, so there's uh, in the when we're talking about total knees, there there's a there's a subset of population that aren't and it's and it's a low percentage that aren't particularly happy when they get this done, and that's the percentage that that a lot of uh, surgeons are chasing and trying to use these newer knee designs and to try to go after, but they're not proven quite yet, and um, you know. It, I think that time will tell, but I agree with Dr. Klein. Um, there are uh, systems that have been out for, and each company has a system that's been out for five to 10 years with proven track records, proven results. Um, and those are the implants that, uh, that we can say with good certainty are going to last that 25 plus years. Perfect. Thank you. This next one may be a little too specific, but we will see. My 90 year old mother, I'm sorry, my mother is 90 years old. Do you recommend joint replacement? Knee, excuse me, joint yes. knee replacement. So uh, uh, this is the question is my mother is 90 years old. Would she, would she be a candidate for a knee replacement? And my take on that is age is just a number. Um, I've operated on 90, 94 year olds who are active, hiking, fixing their own roofs, and live alone. That's a, a 94 year old. So that's a 94 year old, I'd say is absolutely appropriate if their life is limited by their pain and their, their activities are limited by pain. But you have to have a very, very honest conversation 
about uh, operating on elderly patients. Um, there's a finite life expectancy we have at 94 or 90. And are you willing to put in three to six months or nine months of work to get a result? And that may be half of your remaining life. It may be a third or fourth or, or one-tenth of your remaining life. And that's the way I look at it. Uh, and and some people are not good candidates, but there's other 90-year-olds who are good candidates. So it's patient-specific. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I think it all comes down to are you a... 75 year old 90 year old or yes. are you a 95 going on 100 or right. something like that it's contextualized and, each patient. and there's also patients that are 75 that are not healthy Correct. enough to have a total joint done because they're actually physiologically older than that 94 90 year old is. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. thank you and our last question is coming in is the patient conscious during the surgery so the question is is the patient conscious during surgery now um the answer to that is no um, what I think Dr. Klein and I use a similar type philosophy when it comes to, or at least asking what our anesthesiologists use, but the best case scenario for how the anesthesia and your level of awakeness is, um, the, the best case scenario is you get a spinal anesthesia, kind of like an epidural that numbs you for the waist down temporarily, usually around an hour and a half to two hours. Um, you get some sort of added in nerve block. So you're awake when you kind of go into the operating room, but then they give you general anesthesia, usually like a medicine like propofol, enough to kind of drift you off to sleep, but not enough that they're breathing for you or to their need to put a tube down your throat to breathe for you, but just enough so that you're breathing and you're kind of taking a deep sleep. Now, some patients will say, well, I woke up and I heard them banging, I heard them, you know, this and that, um, but it's extremely rare that patients remember any of the procedure once they hit the operating room. Now that's the goal. Now there are some patients where they can't do the spinal and we have to put them completely asleep and they will not remember a darn thing. But there are some that maybe wake up and that, that comes to the anesthesiologist and, and, and that's contextualized to each patient of how deep they can put them and whatnot. But the goal is that you will not remember the procedure. You're getting enough anesthesia to keep you asleep, but not enough uh, if they're able to do a spinal where they're breathing for you. Yeah, we, we don't generally encourage people to want to listen to it. It's Correct. an awkward thing to listen yeah. to, that kind of surgery in your own body. We have people who are awake for other surgeries, but this is not one that I would recommend that. Correct. For those who are old enough, most of our, our, our total joint patients are old enough to have a colonoscopy. So some have not old enough to have a colonoscopy yet. But that's where I tell people what it feels like. It's like a colonoscopy where you kind of have it done and you're sleepy, you don't remember any of it. But that's kind of what it's like. You're sedated and you come out feeling sort of relaxed. Okay. Well, thank you both so much. That was the end of our questions. All right. Well, thank you for your time and the questions today. Uh, if you have any more, if you want some more information, we have a website, uh, www.orthovirginia.com slash, um, what's our blog for today? It's the, if you go to Facebook, uh, you'll find us. Orthovirginia. You'll find it on Facebook. Uh, we'll be posting this link, share it with people. Um, if you guys have additional questions, friends and family, please post them on the comment section and Dr. Klein and I will be following up and answering any questions that we were not able to get to tonight or additional questions that come in. Um, stay safe, uh, please continue to wear your mask and practice social distance, get vaccinated, wash your hands, and thank you very much. It's great sharing some time with you, thank you. Thank you.